on today's episode of the Cryptoverse. How does US tax law apply to Dash and Masternode operators? Let's see if we can get some clarity on this. Voltoro is the one-of-a-kind online exchange where you can trade between gold and Bitcoin. Reserves can be audited online at any time and are protected from confiscation and company failure. Sign up for a free account today by checking out the link in the video description below. Hi there guys and welcome to the latest episode of the Cryptoverse, your regular dose of news and commentary on Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies and blockchains. I am your host, Chris Coney. Now today is the 28th of March, 2017. I don't have any announcements for you today, so I'm going to go straight into the market roundup. Now the very first thing to mention today is that Bitcoin is now slowly recovering day by day. Today, in fact, in the last 24 hours, it's up 5.3%. And on coin market cap, it's listed at $1,048. The chances are by the time you listen to this or watch this episode, it will have moved from that price, no doubt. Uh, most likely have gone higher than that. Now, Dash is sliding a little bit lately off of that 1000 not 1000 $100 mark that was quite stable for a while there. There was um, an interesting observation that Dash had reached like 10 to 1 in terms of Bitcoin, but because that's gone out the window now because Bitcoin's gone up above a thousand and Dash has come down from a hundred. So Dash has actually lost 10.3% today, leaving a Dash at $81.75. Now, understandably, if we scroll down to 12th place here, I've forgotten to highlight this, but we have Decred, big correction for Decred, down 34.7% bringing it down from that $17 mark yesterday to $11.12. Still significant gains for Decred over the last seven days, though. Nothing to sniff out there. Now, Digix Dow, if we go down a little bit further to a 19th position here, Digix Dow being the gold-backed uh, digital asset blockchain, technically the biggest winner today by percentages in the top 20, 6.8% gain on the day. However, we're going to have to take a trip outside of the top 20 today to inspect some very strange activity indeed. The first one of these is Bitcoin Dark, which I have to scroll down to 25th position. I may go slightly further beyond that because we're going to look at Komodo at the same time here. So Bitcoin Dark is listed here at $16.13 after a gain of 218% in the last 24 hours. Now the symbol for Bitcoin Dark is BTCD, Bitcoin Dark, obviously. Now, some of you might have seen that symbol on the exchanges and seen this big gain over the last 24 hours. Now, after a quick bit of investigation from my good self, it seems as though Bitcoin Dark is transitioning the majority of the value to a new blockchain, and that is Komodo, which is down there at 32nd position. So there's this swap going on until January of 2018, where you surrender one Bitcoin Dark and you get approximately 50 Komodos. So these price moves are likely reflecting traders seeing this small window of opportunity to exploit this swap scheme that's going on. This might also explain why Komodo itself, down in 32nd position there, is up 30.6% itself today. Now for the even more strange, we have to go all the way down to 59th position, a bit further, here it is. 59th position, we find XBC, which is also known as Bitcoin Plus. I know, I know, we don't need another Bitcoin variant. You know, they should just call this something different like Komodo have done by renaming Bitcoin Dark. In any case, after $16 million worth of trading, Bitcoin Plus, is now worth $56 a coin. It's $56 exactly. And that represents a, wait for it, 1,242% gain in the last 24 hours. I'd say that's a little bit of an incentive to sell, wouldn't you? Now, I very much doubt that that price is going to stick 
uh, as we'll see over the next few days, with such a gain, uh, it's just too tempting to sell. And this is the reason why I don't normally cover stuff that has small market cap. Because yes, 1,242% gain, it sounds like a lot, but it's, an, it's not a lot in real numbers when you look at the gain in market cap. I mean, there are only, look, 94,000 uh, Bitcoin pluses in existence. So the price per coin changing can have a significant impact on the price because the supply is so limited. You compare that to a Dash or a Bitcoin with several million coins in circulation and a change in price on an individual coin obviously doesn't have that much of an impact. So in the news segment today, I've headed over to Dash's official documentation. Now you may remember me saying on a previous episode of the Cryptoverse that Dash had actually commissioned a law firm to clarify things relating to Dash. So they hired this law firm that has expertise in digital payments and digital currencies. And they did this a while ago. And now this project is starting to bear fruit. So as we go through this, we have to remember not to rely on this as solid legal advice for us individually, even though it may have come from a law firm. And that's because there's no real way to know how you know, a real judge is going to interpret the law when a real case goes through the real legal system. And that's why often you hear the phrase, this is not intended to be legal advice, because no matter how thoroughly a lawyer goes through a law and looks at your business, they cannot predict how the judge, this other human being, is going to act, think, and interpret the law at the time when the case is on the table. So lawyers have a very hard job in that regard. The great thing, though, about this piece of work is that at least Dash has been proactive. I mean, who knows? This document may very well help legal professionals see how the law applies to Dash, even if those legal professionals aren't digital currency experts themselves. So let's see what they've got for us. This is looking at Dash under United States law to begin with, and then maybe they'll do other projects in the future. In the course of our mission, and this is Dash talking, we have received inquiries into how some aspects of Dash are treated under United States law. The promise of this document is to address the most common of these inquiries and explain how we believe the law applies to Dash. Cool. So let's have a look at the tax law section of this. It says, one of the most common questions we receive is this. How are masternode operators treated under US tax laws? Now that question might be slightly annoying for a team of cryptocurrency developers. However, Dash consider themselves as an organization. So it's perfectly reasonable to ask an organization such questions. You know, Dash sell themselves as a decentralized, autonomous organization or corporation, whatever you want to call it. So if Dash were a company or an organization, it would be perfectly reasonable to ask these kinds of questions and expect them to know the answers in law because it's their responsibility to know how their business operates in the jurisdiction that they operate in. It's a little bit different with blockchains because they don't really have a jurisdiction, but, but in any case, we're in transition between that old way of thinking and this new way of thinking. So block rewards. It says block rewards are paid to masternode operators in exchange for val validating transactions on the Dash network. To be sure, Dash masternodes do not mine as such, but the IRS considers using computing resources to validate transactions and maintain the public ledger, at least in Bitcoin, to constitute mining. Right, when it comes to writing laws for technology, there are two forces pulling in opposite directions. On the technology side, the nuance matters a lot because technology is very precise. And then on the legal side, we can't expect the laws to specifically mention every single thing in every single scenario and be technically accurate in every way. So the IRS here says that if you're using computing resources to validate transactions and maintain a public ledger, then you are mining according to the law. Well, that's technically inaccurate because anyone running a full node is using computing resources to validate transactions and maintain a public ledger. And we know that's very different to mining. But that's my point, though, about these two opposing forces. The computer scientist in me wants to be pedantic and say, 
this is technically not mining, but the businessman in me wants to avoid having laws written that are thousands and thousands of pages long. The bottom line here, though, is that Mastodon operators should treat their rewards as regular income at fair market value and account for them in that way. Then this next section goes on to talk about staked Dash. Now, to run a Dash master node, you have to put 1000 Dash in a wallet that you control before you can actually set up a master node. The important thing to mention here, though, is that you don't set up a server to act as a Dash master node and then deposit your 1000 Dash on that server. Not at all. All you do is broadcast the address where that 1000 Dash is held to prove that you own it and that you control it. That wallet then gets linked to your master node so that everyone can see that your master node is backed by a thousand dash that you control. Now that 1000 dash never leaves your wallet. So when people talk about hacking into dash master nodes and stealing the funds, well that displays a misunderstanding of how it works. <clears throat> Tone vase. So if a master node operator removes that 1000 dash from the designated wallet, the network automatically cancels your master node status and you no longer receive the reward, so that's that. From a legal standpoint, the money has not moved an inch. You know, it hasn't changed owner, it has not been transferred, it has not been exchanged, and it has not been sold. Therefore, in the blue, the holding of the 1000 Dash for purposes of qualifying as a Mastodode operator should not cause a taxable event to occur because the user has not transferred any of the benefits and the burdens of ownership. So that's how we should treat the 1000 Dash that is used as collateral. The block reward we treat as regular income at the market rate, and this 1000 Dash doesn't create a taxable event because it's not transferred in ownership. However, what if we sell some of the 1000 Dash that we were using as collateral? That takes us on to this capital gain section. It says that assuming the masternode operator held the 1000 Dash either for investment purposes or for purposes of qualifying as a masternode operator, the IRS would likely treat gain or loss on the sale of those Dash tokens as capital in nature. So this makes it important to keep a record of when you bought the 1000 Dash and at what price you acquired it. You would subtract that from the price you sold at in order to determine whether you had, had a capital gain or a capital loss and thus whether you owe any capital gains tax. This assumes, of course, that when you sell the Dash, you sell it for US dollars. If you spend it on goods or services, I don't think that would count as a capital gain, would it? I mean, let me know what you think in the comments below on that point. If you buy the Dash with US dollars, but then you spend the Dash and receive computer games, can you consider that a capital gain? Say if I bought one Dash at $10 and Dash went up to $100, and then I bought two computer games at $50 each, I've got $100 worth of value. I've got the benefit of $100 worth of purchasing power, even though I only paid 10 US dollars for the Dash in the first place. But in that case, I didn't technically sell the Dash back into US dollars. I didn't buy for $10 and then receive the $100, which would be a $90 capital gain, in my spending example, I spent the dash and received goods. So yeah, there we go. <laughs> How do we consider that? Let me know in the comments below. Now I'm going to stop at this point. There is another part of this article, which is about whether masternodes could be criminally liable for transactions that they relay. But depending on the feedback I get from this episode, I'll consider doing another one covering this other criminal stuff, maybe tomorrow or the next day. So thanks for joining me today, guys. If you liked this episode, hit the like button. If you disliked it, hit the dislike button. Please leave me a comment below with some feedback and get subscribed. And please support the Cryptoverse and boost cryptocurrency adoption by going to cryptoversity.com forward slash podcast and becoming a patron. From just a few dollars a month, you can secure Cryptoversity's future, get unlimited access to all Cryptoversity courses and access a private patrons only chat group where you get direct access to me. That is all for today, guys. I'll be back tomorrow with another episode of the Cryptoverse. So until then, it's me, Chris Coney, saying bye for now.